everyone. So I am in front of the Meadow House, which is the current house that we are renovating here at Flock. But I wanted to do this for Plant One On Me because I'm gonna be prepping plants for the house. And I have some of the plants actually out here behind me. This I would say is going to be about one third to somewhere between one third and one half of the plants that I'm eventually going to be putting in the Meadow House. And you'll recognize a number of them because most of them are actually from my place in Brooklyn. There are a few that I have acquired along the way. I think I picked one up at, at the farmer's market. You may have re recall that we did a tour at Longwood Gardens and I went home with like a beautiful Cattleya. So there are some new acquisitions, but a lot of the ones I've had uh, in Brooklyn for quite some time, and they're gonna find a new space and a new home here. Now, some of the conditions are a little different than my home in Brooklyn. For example, this place is half the size of my apartment in Brooklyn. So this is a pretty much would be considered maybe a large, tiny house, if you will. And I don't have as expansive as windows. There are a lot of windows in this building, but I don't have as expansive of windows as I did in my apartment in Brooklyn. That being said, there's no obstructions. There's no buildings that are obstructing any of the sunlight coming through. And because this is a tinier building, we get more pass-through light. So I'm really going to be paying attention to what plants I'm gonna be putting in this building. And I'll do an episode on that where we do a houseplant home tour, but you'll get a sneak peek of some of the plants that I actually have here. And what I'd like to do because it is the month of September is that it's getting into the not so growing season. <laughs> so um, I'll be doing some clipping, uh, basically plant chores, clipping, fertilizing. This will probably be my last fertilizing of the season. Maybe not, in some cases I might do um, October and just kind of wane it off into the fall months. And then um, I'm doing some repotting as well. So join me. Well, I've sort of confined myself in here, but um, what I'm kind of tackling, I have these somewhat separated out. I have a lot of the cacti, succulents, aloes over in this corner. What I'm likely going to do is give them a good water and I'll give them really good cactus fertilizer. And so I'll just drench those. It looks like this euphorbia over here has some dry bits. Like this part just actually came off right here, so I'll probably clip some of those off. Obviously with euphorbias, you gotta take care of not getting that um, wax or that latex on you because it could actually blind you and it could actually burn you. So that's something to take uh, into consideration. Of course, if it's a dry bit, then there's no latex or no sap actually in the plant. It has to be from the live parts of the plant. This is a great example of a plant that I had in Brooklyn. And you see that some of it is sun stressed. And that I think is still from my place in Brooklyn because I had this in a direct Southern window. And I'm gonna move this to probably more of a Western exposure. When I got back to Brooklyn, I saw that it was quite sun stressed, maybe a little too uh, yellow for my liking. So I think this will be useful to give it a nice fertilizer, maybe a little less intense light and a good thorough watering. Now with a lot of these cacti and succulents, you may say, well, you don't need to water them too much. And that's true, but always give them a drench to the point that the water shows up in the bottom of the saucer. And you could always drain that out afterwards as well. You wanna make sure that you just water them as thoroughly as possible. A lot of the nutrients, a lot of the oxygen is taken up in the small rootlets below. And sometimes, especially if I don't have a saucer below and it's a closed container and you're, you're growing it in a cash po, which is usually a no-no, but sometimes I've done it as well. And uh, it, I, I don't water it as thoroughly. And so the roots remain a bit more superficial. And when that happens, the plant may not be as healthy or it has a chance to ba basically tip over because the roots aren't growing all the way through. So again, when you water, make sure that you water thoroughly. And I'm gonna have a lot of these on these and like wood shelves, and some of them are from old barn wood. And I wanna be able to maintain that barn wood and the look of the barn wood without any saucer spots. So it's one of those things that we'll just have to be mindful of when I'm placing them in the meadow home behind me.
Now here's some great examples of some aloes. And this one is also a bit sun-stressed. And sun-stress doesn't mean a bad thing either. You know, sometimes we stress our Hoyas and things like that in order to be able to get that kind of reddish or pinkish hue. And most of these plants could handle that. But if you're giving them a lot of sun exposure, make sure that you're watering them accordingly. So if you have this aloe, let's say, in an eastern window, then you're gonna have a little bit of a gentler light and you're probably gonna have to water a little less than if you have it in a southern or western exposure. So those are some things to keep in mind. I also have a hose, so I might use the hose to fill up some of these plants. And I have some distilled water, and I'm going to use this, reserve this for one of the Hoyas that I'm going to repot, which is kind of like top of mind and top of list. Oh, I wanna show you this Cattleya too, because this Cattleya actually bloomed for me. This is one of the ones that I got from Longwood, and this is just a hybrid, Alice B. DuPont Waldor. So this one was a beautiful white flamboyant bloom, and it smelled so divine. And it bloomed for quite some time. You know, I'm not really an orchid orchidophile, but uh, I have gotten a fair share of orchids and I actually have three, I believe, or maybe four even in this, in this house. So uh, this is all new growth right here as well. You could see this kind of bright new growth in here as well. So I think it's pretty happy. See a nice new root growing here. So I'm gonna give this a nice drench. I also have a, a kind of a decrepit root, root right here, so it's not all good. But um, this root has already kind of grabbed onto the container, so I think this is, this guy is gonna be in this container for quite some time. He's already grabbed on. This hose has been sitting out in the sun for a little bit, and I wanna make sure that the water is not too warm. It's actually better to have slightly warm water than really cold water for the roots, because uh, you could really chill the roots, but it's uh, early morning sun. I'm actually doing this in the morning, so it hasn't really heated up that much. If, uh, if I start doing this in the late afternoon and it's gonna be a scorcher today, sometimes that water is boiling hot. So I'm just gonna drop in some of this cactus fertilizer. And this will be one of the first things that I wanted to do because I haven't really been in my place in Brooklyn all that often. So I'm on a completely different regime than I used to be when I was there full time. And since I'm splitting my time between here and block and everything along those lines, I wanted to make sure that uh, I could still handle it. So I go in like a week on, a week off, basically things like that. But it could get uh, pretty demanding at times. So slowly I've cut back my collection or started to focus on plants that need a little less attention. And obviously cacti and succulents are a pretty good choice. Sometimes in some cases philodendrons, you know, if you give a good watering before you leave, then oftentimes you're not watering every day of the week. So, uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been somewhat manageable. And I think for this place, because this will be serve as kind of a bit more of our guest house as well as for one of us while we're here. But if we have a guest, we'll put our guest down here. And I want to have plants that, you know, don't require me to come in and ruin the guest's experience <laughs> by having to come in and water the plants. So these are plants that aren't too finicky, I would say. Even our prayer plants, I have uh, one Maranta, and then I have one uh, Tenanthi. The Tenanthi is right there. And they seem to be a little less needy than say if I had the uh, Japortia or the Calathea. Now, a lot of these plants I'm gonna be putting in Western and Southern windows, which if you're in the Northern hemisphere, you will know that that's where the majority of the light comes through, provided that you don't have any kind of obstructions outside your window, or sometimes we have like low E on our windows and that prevents the sunlight from coming in entirely. People who are in those big glass high rises or anything along those lines, well then they'll oftentimes experience that because um, the light is more diffuse actually, which is not bad for some of these plants. And in, in many cases, the Hoyas want something that is a little shadier. They don't want to be totally sun scorched and full sun.
Now this is my Isoclades. I'll come show this to you. You'll probably recognize this from 365 Days of Plants, which I did way back when. So this is one of my Isoclades. And uh, this is one of those more succulent orchids. It doesn't get anything that's um, a too spectacular bloom, nothing like the Cattleya, for example. But uh, I find them to be very easy to care for orchids. In fact, if anybody's venturing to get into orchids, then I would recommend this would be one of my top three orchids to try. It's easier than a Phalaenopsis, in my opinion, because the Phalaenopsis, in order to get it to rebloom again, I often find you have to get it into a slightly chilled temperature. So having it next to a colder window or anything along those lines, I think really helps. But I think the leaves of this are quite stunning. If you take a Phalaenopsis, the leaves on a Phalaenopsis are like, you know, nothing to call home to mom about, but these I think are just quite striking. And you could see that they're shaped um, in a way where they're like a, a slide or a tube. Um, and I would imagine because they are in slightly drier conditions that when the water does drop or when dew collects, it starts to work its way down to the roots. So it's, it's really channeling water to, to the roots. So if you look at that and kind of consider the morphology of the plant, say, well, how do you think this plant was growing in the wild? Um, is, is this leaf uh, a water collecting tool? And trying to surmise those things even without having to see these plants in the wild, I think is really useful. And hey, you might be wrong, but at least you're getting your noggin uh, working and your cogs turning and saying, okay, you know, this is how I may intuit a plant's needs. So anyway, this is a, a beautiful plant. I see a new leaf kind of coming up right in here. <laughs> So uh, I think this will be happy. Has this ever bloomed for me? I'm actually not sure. Maybe I haven't stressed it enough to bloom. So a lot of plants will bloom when they're a bit stressed. Um, but if they're babied, sometimes they don't even bloom. But I don't recall this blooming. It doesn't even have a bloom stock up, but I could have missed it along the way too. Some regular fertilizer for these guys. And this will have a nice high nitrogen content. This is good for plants that have, uh, that are primarily grown for their leaves and not necessarily their flowers. So this is one of my philodendrons that I have here. I don't know if I'm gonna keep this in the house. We'll see what I, I do. I might take this actually up to the common house. I don't have a really nice space for it, I think in here. I have an idea of where I'd like to put it but it's a bit further away from a window than I would like. And uh, we'll see. This one's doing great here. So this one was getting a little scorched because I had it outside and it's nice to be able to bring some plants outside and give them some light, but sometimes the light was a little bit too much. And I actually had repotted this in another pot and then I have now put this in a new pot because um, I wanted to use that other pot for something else. <laughs> I'd like to show you this Hoya curtisii. And this is a great example of like how it's a bit greener behind. And then in the front, it's uh, a lot redder. So this is way more sun stressed. And it's not, a, like I said, it's not a bad thing as long as you're giving it water. This seems to be um, growing quite prolific prolifically. But if I brought this into the house right now, I would, guarantee that this will green up pretty much within two or three days. So it'll start to lose that kind of redness of the leaves. So whenever you're buying plants online, keep that in mind because sometimes folks will like sun stress the plant and then you'll think that will be the color of the plant that when you get it. But if you're putting it in completely different light conditions, say lower light conditions, then the plant will likely not redden up. Same thing goes for begonias. I know that's a, a, uh, an issue that Steve's leaves said, you know, he's growing them in greenhouses. And then when you bring begonia, begonias inside and you're not growing them in a greenhouse condition with like optimal light, then those leaves will change. Even the flower color will change. So that's something to take uh, into consideration when you're purchasing plants, especially ones um, online or even in nurseries. Okay, so I think everything is pretty much fertilized. And this plant I'll show you is 
one of my walking irises. And if you recall, I did an episode where I was comparing different plants and I'd say, instead of this plant, choose this plant. And what I like about the walking iris is that it kind of is similar to our spider plants in the sense that it has this like punky foliage and it also creates these little offsets. So let me show you this offset. It's right there. And it's, you know, pretty, it's different from this spider plant because the spider plant puts out these little stoloniferous things and it's very, very prolific. Walking iris is a little less prolific, but the flowers, oh boy, they are so beautiful. So these come out like white, look like it looks just like an iris flower and it's white with like deep purple centers. And they seem to only bloom for like a day or two for me and then they're, then they're out. Um, but I had some consecutive blooms on this this year and it was just so lovely. And this is one of the plants that I actually picked up uh, at a farmer's market for 10 bucks, which was so awesome. And I had a couple of these in my house in Brooklyn, but one was in a large container of the Raphidophora tetrasperma that I have. So I planted that in with the Raphidophora tetrasperma. And the other one, I think I've just lost. <laughs> so, um, it's one of those things where when I saw this, I was like, oh, this is awesome. So I picked this up at the farmer's market last year and now it has a good home but it's in its regular nursery pot and it's time to repot this up. So I'm gonna give this some of the regular cactus potting medium. You could go with a regular grow medium as well, but I like it cause it's a little airy. And I think this will be good for its size because this is one that I had it sitting in. And this is more like, I was using it more like a cash po, even though it wasn't. So you could still see that it has some roots down here. This is more of the roots. Wasn't intensely root bound, but the roots look really good. I'm gonna try not to break them so I won't touch them too much, but I could just tease them out, just little bits here and there. And then that way it'll be able to grow down into the pot with some of the new potting medium that I'm giving it. And I'm just gonna give that a good water. This is an example of a plant that will slightly lose its color if you don't give it any water or if you have it in too much sunlight. And I think the spider plant is pretty much like that as well. It starts to get like a duller kind of uh, lighter color. The chlorophyll seems to kind of leave it, gets a bit more of a sallow shade. So you just wanna make sure that you give it a good watering. Let me give a little bit more water to this guy too. So this one I'm gonna clip. You'll see that there's this section right here that's really brown. I'm just gonna snip that right off, just like that. Some of these aloes also have uh, brown bits. So what I'm gonna do is actually snip those dead leaves off. And that's really just an aesthetic thing. It's very common for aloes to have put out some uh, dry leaf, bit, leaf bits on the bottom. It's actually in evolutionary speaking, it's one of those things that actually protect them in the wild. So as the aloe starts to grow up, then it'll start to get some of these um, crusty old leaves and they'll retain those leaves so that animals don't, uh, are not enticed to actually eat the plant. All right, so this is Hoya linearis. I had a small cutting and then I picked this one up I would say about 11 months ago, maybe. And I think they're easier to take care of when they're a bit more established. So what I'm gonna do is give this a good distilled water drink. I'm also going to use just a little bit of fertilizer. It's not uh, a bad idea actually to give this a little bit of Tillandsia fertilizer I've found. So if you are essentially uh, spraying your Tillandsia, which is the type of fertilizer it kind of goes for, just need a little hint of this organic fertilizer. Then you could actually spray some of the leaves. The leaves have this kind of fuzzy nature, these trichomes on it. This is a plant that grows towards the Himalayas and I think what it relies on is some of that cool mist that comes through. 
that mist gets caught on some of the soft trichomes of these leaves. Now there are some dead bits here, so I'm just gonna go through this and cut them off before I actually transplant this into a ceramic container. Okay, so I'm just gonna gently take this out. A good way of taking this out is actually crushing the pot a little bit, just smooshing it. And sometimes that you is, uh, will help bring the plant out more easily, just like that. Okay, doesn't feel too root bound actually, which is a good sign. So that's more of what the roots look like. It looks pretty good to me. Not too root bound and it's easy to actually move the roots down below. So I used quite a bit of water to just get all the dirt off the leaves and everything along those lines. And I've watered this quite a bit as well. So if I put this back into the house, then I risk, I run the risk of this just rotting. So what I'm gonna do is actually use this good weather and have this sit outside. I'm in a protected area where there's not too much sun and basically just let this air off and dry off before I actually bring this indoors. Keep your eyes peeled here because we'll be doing a great big reveal and houseplant home tour of the newly renovated Meadow House in the coming weeks. And be sure to tune in to our sister channel over at Flock Finger Lakes if you're keen to see the entire year-long renovation and outdoor gardening videos. In the meantime, check out our online site, homesteadbrooklyn.com, for online houseplant courses like Houseplant Basics, Houseplant Masterclass, and some of our latest additions like the Medicinal Herbal Flowchart. We'll see you in the next video.